two, so I think we can make a start. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Regeneration and Public Protection Protection Scrutiny Meeting for Tuesday, the 19th of January. Um, first item on the agenda, any apologies for absence? Um, yes, Chair, we've had apologies from two of our co-opted members, Hilary Hopkins and Howard Jackson. Okay. Thanks for that, Maeve. Um, agenda item number two is any declarations of interest. Members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government and Finance Act 1992, relating to Council Tax, the Local Government Act 2000, the Council's Constitution and the Members' Code of Conduct. Members are reminded that they must identify the item number and subject matter that their interest relates to and signify the nature of the personal interest and where members withdraw from a meeting as a consequence of the disclosure of a prejudicial interest, they must notify the chair when they arrive. Any um, declarations of interest, please? Okay, we don't appear to have any, thank you. Okay, so moving on to agenda item three, and it's a, an update report, um, violence against women and girls, domestic abuse and sexual violence. And I think at this stage, um, we welcome to the meeting uh, from Safe and Earth Tidville, Nicola Marnie and Julie Beck. Hello, both. Hi there, thanks for attending. Um, I think in the first instance, if you can provide an overview of the report, um, and then I'll invite members then to um, ask any questions or, or comments they have on any specifics involved in the report. We also have Taryn Stevens, who is um, uh, from the Social Services Department, um, who uh, we can ask uh, questions to along the way as, as well. So over to, to Nicola or, or, or Julie, it doesn't, doesn't matter uh, who in particular, and um, if you just uh, introduce the topic, please. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Nicola Marnie. I'm the Chief Executive for, for Safe and Mercy Tidville. And my colleague and Deputy Chief Executive, Julie Beck, is, is alongside me. So if I forget anything, Julie will chip in and vice versa. Uh, hopefully we can pass on as much information and then furnish you with as much information as you need this, this afternoon. Um, Chair, can I firstly start by offering an apology for Deb Evans, who's the regional advisor uh, for the Voucher SV agenda. Uh, unfortunately, she, she's unwell, um, which then may leave in, in some of the report where, mm. where Deb might have alluded to some regional workings. Um, obviously, Julie and I will do our best to, to plug the gap, but should we not be able to answer the question that Deb might have been able to, then we'll come back to you if that's OK after the meeting. Yeah, that, that's perfectly fine, Nicola. Thank you for that information. Um, yeah, you know, if there's anything um, um, pertinent um, that, that Deb can answer, then, then certainly um, she can come back to us at a later point. Thank you. I mean, obviously, from the, the committee's um, uh, request. We, we've, we've pulled together an update report in, in terms of the, the voter SV agenda for, for Merthyr Tidbill and, and touched upon some of the, the regional aspect. Um, so the purpose really is, is just to, to raise awareness and to, to bring you up to speed with what's going on, particularly in the locality, but then that, that broader aspect across the region. Um, with that in mind, uh, much of the focus of the report is predominantly on the services that we, Safe and Merthyr Tidville, deliver um, on behalf of yourselves and, and, and others for the, the local community. Um, if, if I just start with, with um, the, 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 the where we are then, um, and I, I don't want to, to sort of go into to great depth, you because obviously I'm aware that that committee members have had the report um, and I, I may just steal your thunder in terms of answering the questions that you might have wanted to ask um, afterwards. So if I keep it as, as briefly as I possibly can. So going through the format of the report um, in terms of the, the way we are, that pretty much sets the scene for um, or, or where we were in essence, sets the scene for the, the inception really from our perspective of the Voucher SV Act and how services have evolved 
during that time and, and to date. Um, I don't know, Chair, if there's anything particular that you want me to, to, to bring out in that section uh, to highlight or if the points within are sort of have been considered by the committee and, and we'll come up with questioning afterwards. Yeah, OK. Um, I think the reason that the committee wanted to focus on, on domestic violence is, is because of the coronavirus and the, and the various lockdowns we've had. And obviously that's that's compounded DV. Um, we want to see what impact this yeah. had on, on the service provision within Merthyr Tidville. Um, so, so perhaps if we can look at um, how it's changed really from from the inset of the coronavirus um, uh, uh, crisis um, and, and look at, you know, the impact that's had on, on demand mm -hmm. for the service and, and and what impact that that's had, if, if that's okay, Nicola? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's pretty much the, the way we are now, really, in, in terms of, I mean, we very much live in, in that, that COVID world at the moment. Um, and it, it has had a massive impact, not, not only on service pro providers, but, but service users as well, because of all of the restrictions that that brings along with it. Um, I know in the, in the, the first uh, section where we've put some statistical information, that, that kind of makes comparisons year on year. And then in the, the, the where are we now, there have been some, some further statistical information that highlights that there have been increases in, in access to service, uh, not necessarily increasing numbers of referrals because that is not a significant rise for us. However, what we've got is a 50% increase in capacity in, in uptake in service. Um, which obviously creates then capacity issues. Um, I will bring in alongside me here in terms of statistical ev ev evidence is, is Julie. Jewel, I'm sure she's there. I can see her, her initials. You there, Jill? Sorry, I've been put on mute at some point during the meeting. Sorry about that. Um, yes, so as Nicola rightly said, we've seen around a 50% increase in engagement rather than a 50% increase in referrals. Now it's like everything else is the story that sits behind the detail of those of those data sets, isn't it? So if I can take you back to just prior to when we were all told to go into lockdown, we had a significant increase in uh, contacts from past survivors who were being re-triggered by the fact that they were then going to go into lockdown. As you know, from a DV perspective, um, it's a lot to do with control um, of individuals. So that was something we seen just prior to the lockdown. Then we had quite a lot of um, sort of downtime where people were really quiet and I think getting to grips with the fact that they had a new way of, of, of life as such and sorting out their own um, sort of working uh, aspects, etc. And then it started to rise again. And as I uh, put in the report, during May, we've seen 44% increase in contacts with, with our clients. And I think it struck home by then the, that we were going to be uh, sort of in lockdown for a significant period of time. So I think a lot of people were trying to get a ducks in order, to be honest with you, and to be able to make contact with services to make sure that they were still there, they were still visible, they were still an avenue for um, getting out of the of the home environment if they needed to. Uh, we're away from all the statistics um, that we've gathered over the, the sort of um, period of time last year, that the severity of abuse increased, whereas we know that around 35 incidents happened before um, a woman would, would seek support. I think that's come down significantly simply because the severity of the incidents, because of everything that's been going on with lockdown and financial issues and furlough and all those additional worries that go into the melting pot with, for families, we know that the severity of abuse has increased so people are more likely to ask for help and assistance earlier in those incidences. The other thing that we know um, is that around 50, perhaps just over 50% of our of our cases, our open cases, are in relation to um, ex-partner 
Uh, and the fact that, you know, post-separation abuse is a huge, huge thing that we deal with, especially around child contact issues, start, uh, stalking and harassment. So you almost had that perfect storm where people were locked at home. Even if they weren't locked in with their abuser, there was an ex-partner who knew exactly where they were most of the day because people weren't leaving their homes. And there was a lot of abuse and there was a lot of issues and difficulties around child contact. People were contacting us, do I still allow child contact to happen, etc. So there, there were some concerns over that as well. So although you had some some of our clients that, that were locked away with their abusers, there was also quite a number that were suffering stalking and harassment and ongoing abuse by an ex-partner as well. A couple of other sort of practical measures that um, possibly sort of uh, contributed to the fact that more people came into us for support was the fact that more people were contactable. So there's, there's, you know, although we get quite a high number of referrals, there's, there's sometimes people that we try three or four or five times and we can't get hold of them. More people were contactable over the lockdown period because they were at home. Um, plus the fact then we increased the ways that we were asking people or we were making ourselves available to people. So we did huge social media campaigns. We put additional stuff on our website where they could contact um, sort of 12 o'clock in the night. Uh, they could put a contact form into us. We put an awful lot more sort of effort and, and sort of um, processes then in place, knowing that people were, were at home and they weren't having those normal mechanisms to come through for support. Um, another part of why potential increase was that we're aware of um, adolescent parent abuse, just not just the intimate partner abuse, it was familial uh, abuse as well. And it may be in the fact that, you know, that was a, a sort of uh, melting pot uh, uh, that was sort of increasing because the fact that young people couldn't leave their, their houses, people were locked in. So we've seen a rise in, a, um, in the adolescent parent abuse um, sort of section of our cases as well. So as you can see, there's, there's quite a, a number of different reasons why we might have had that additional engagement during lockdown period. Does that answer the question, Chair? Yeah, thank thank you for that, Julie. Um, can I can I just um, ask my own question here on four point seven um, states that the the Mara cases um, during last year they exceeded um, the recommended cases per uh, ten thousand female head of the population by thirty nine percent. What what's the the benchmark there. What what's the the safe life's recommended cases per ten thousand? It's the, it, it will be different for different areas, chair. Simply because okay. um, obviously Merthyr is a smaller area, so the concentration of high risk um, cases in Merthyr area is thirty nine percent higher than what the recommended what the recommended sort of figure is by 10,000 head of female population. So it's a benchmark the safe lives use because all, all the the, uh, the Marek data from all the different Mareks across the UK, not just Wales, get fed into safe lives so that they can put a, a comparison in. But we are at that figure or even higher consistently in Merthyr which just mm -hmm. evidences that high risk nature of, of the local sort of picture with regards to DV. And that, that's the figure for 1920. Yeah. Presumably that, that figure is even higher now. Is that right? We don't, we don't have those figures at this moment in time. Those were up until, I think it was September. It's the way that, um, yeah, it's the way that Safe Lives reports. They don't report um, like our quarters, etc. They report, um, so it would be April last year till um, May this year. So they, so they support on an annual figure, but but it moves on per month. Do, do you okay. know where okay. Yeah, it's rolling. Okay. Does, um, how do our figures in Merthyr Tidville compare to neighbouring authorities such as RCT and Regend? Okay, I can answer for RCT only because we sh we we've got a, a like a shared Marek. We don't share the Marek, but we've got a shared Marek team. We've got a shared uh, Marek Hui group, and um, Bridgend is sort of sort of late um, sort of come into that group. 
Um, RCT is lower than us, obviously the concentration per 10,000 head of population um, means that um, we are higher than RCT. Okay, and are there, are there any factors unique to Merthyr that, um, that ensures that we, we're higher than, than RCT? Because Merthyr and areas of RCT are very similar social economic sort of um, uh, portfolio. So is there anything unique to Merthyr that, that, that sees the, the higher incidence of domestic violence? Not specifically that we've ever sort of drilled down to, to be honest with you, because as we know, um, domestic abuse affects all different walks of life. It's, it's not just, you know, um, areas of deprivation, etc. But I think what we have sort of coming through in Merthyr is probably more people um, coming through to our service because we've been, we are an embedded service. We, you know, we have a lot of um, we, we have a lot of self-referrals coming into our services because of, of word of mouth, et cetera. Plus we have sort of police uh, data, et cetera. But uh, for us in Merth, I think we, we, we have a very visible service. We have a lot more, um, like I said, self-referrals coming in. We are very accessible, but we've never, we've never got to that sort of golden nugget of why Merth um, specifically in, in relation to, in comparison to any other area. Yeah, OK, thanks for that. I, I've got other queries on, on other items within the report, but at this stage I'd like to open it up to the committee. So does any committee members have, have any questions, please? No? OK, I think you got off lightly then. <laughs> um, OK. Um, oh, I think, uh, sorry, a, a quick question. Hello, Lee. Yeah. Hello, sorry. Can you come in, Lee? Thanks, Jay. Uh, Julie, I, in terms of the Marek, um, is that just domestic violence of figures there or does that cover sexual violence as well? No, that is purely domestic abuse. Okay. You do, you know, you, we have partners on the table, that is, but that is specifically DV cases and incidences, yeah. Okay, the, the only other question I have is um, Operation Encompass. Do the police uh, give you the figures for that? Uh, are they in touch with you regarding that? No, you don't. Not at all, no. Um, Provided I'm on the same wavelength, Lee, is it in relation to the information that, that goes out to schools? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. No. Um, we don't have anything to do with that information. I believe that is comes directly from the police to the schools. Um, but obviously, uh, our service has all the police incidents reports that come through. So we would have the same type of information. Um, yeah. But they deal with that information separately um, via the schools. I just didn't know whether they referred then from there to you regarding that. Yeah, all all police incidents in with that that are, that are DV related, they all come to our service. Whether that's high risk, medium risk, um, male, female victims, they all come to us, and we contact every person to offer support. Okay, great. I think Tari wants to answer something. Um, Councillor Davis, I was just going to share in terms of operation in campus that obviously the level of information that's shared with education differs to what would be shared with SMT. However, they would have those referrals sent through. So even though education don't share them, the police would duplicate and they process if that makes sense. So they would send one referral to school, one to children's services and one to SMT. Do, do, Tarin, do, do you know if that's increased as well? The, the levels from Encompass or, you know, especially with the schools being closed, I, I don't know what impact this having. I suppose in terms of children's services statistics that come through and a very high proportion of that is related to domestic violence. Overall, we've seen a decrease in the level of referrals that have come through to children's services in general. For me, that isn't an indicator from my perspective that there being less community concerns, but about there being less professionals directly engaging with families at this moment in time, so identifying safeguarding concerns. But I think what is important to note is that children's services conversion rate is far higher, so pro per proportion of referrals that we have coming through, a higher level are safeguarding referrals. And in terms of children's services intake and assessment team, the level of allocations for assessment is exactly the same as prior to the pandemic. Okay, so thank you. Coming through at a far higher level. 
Mm. Yeah. Thank you. From our perspective, um, the, the level of referrals coming through hasn't heightened um, significantly. It's the level of, of engagement for us, for our service in particular, it has has gone up by 50%. I think it's fair to say as well, Jules, to support Taryn, what, what Taryn has just said, that the severity of abuse and the complexities associated with the families has also increased. So therefore, the, the level of intervention is elongated based on, on, on those additional needs. Yeah, so I, I, I had, there was a period, up. yeah, there was a period where I was having lots, especially in the, towards the end of the summer months where People were out drinking in the gardens, and you know, there was lots of concern. Then I'm, I'm really glad that that sorry, the the 35 you talked about earlier, that because that was increasing uh, before lockdown. I'm glad that they are contacting you much earlier than 35 occasions. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lee. Malcolm, do you want to come in at this point? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a quick thing. Has domestic violence been a historic problem in Merthyr Tidville? Is it getting worse over time? And if so, what additional resources and measures are we putting in place to prevent it? It is just, it is in an historic um, issue in Merthyr. Um, we started our services, our community services around 2003 in Merthyr Tidville and um, that was one, one support worker and one part-time manager and just to sort of compare that to the, the team now and we've got um, three high-risk IDVAs uh, dealing with just purely high-risk and we've got two support workers, a recovery worker and a manager so it has increased the, the and obviously um, that's, that's it's not a good thing. I don't mean that. I mean, there is an, an issue with, with domestic abuse in Merthyr Tidville, but I think we've got better at identifying victims earlier in the process and getting them to, into specialist services um, where they consent, obviously. We've got some other services in Merthyr, such as IRS that works alongside health in primary care with the GP practices. Again, the focus of that is identifying and having that conversation with people to identify victims and offering them specialist support. So I think we've got more sophisticated in our approach and how we actually identify people earlier in the process and offer support earlier in the process. So I think that has increased numbers. But yes, I, I do think domestic abuse is a particular issue in this area. I mean, I'd go as far as to say that domestic abuse in Merthyr Tidville and the Valleys per se is endemic. Um, I don't think there's been an, any year in the length of, of duration that we've been involved with, with provision of service that there hasn't been high levels uh, and rates of, of domestic abuse uh, in Merthyr. But as, as Julie has said, I think over time the services have become recognisable, as was once the, the, the time where, you know, safeguarding was put on the, the agenda of everybody then it's now become inherent into safeguarding domestic abuse and keeping these families safe. So I think people are far more willing to come forward. So for as long as we've got a, a, an endemic issue, we'll always see domestic abuse. But I think what is really heartening is, as Julie said, we've, come, we've become more sophisticated, far more ho holistic approach in terms of whole family offer rather than just the victim and holding the victim accountable for the actions of another person so the perpetrator is now uh, accessing services where possible and so are the children and and young people involved uh, you know who witness domestic abuse uh, notwithstanding that everybody once thought that if they were in the household provided they were in bed then they weren't victims we all know now that, that that's not the case. I mean, as professionals, we've known that anyway. Um, but I think the general population are starting to understand that homes have to be a safe environment for children to be to be nurtured and, and flourish. So I think we're becoming far more recognisable of, of, of domestic abuse and far more willing for it to be everybody's business. Mm. 
Thank, thank you for that. Thank, thank you for that, Nicola. Sobering information, but um, at the same time important um, to hear and good to hear rather the significance of domestic violence has has risen on, on the agenda through throughout the last number of years. I, I just at this point, can I bring in Tarin, please? I appreciate you. I think you you have to leave the meeting, Tarin, quite soon. Is that correct? Oh, my uh, next meeting has been cancelled, so I'm here as long as you need me. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry to rush the the situation then, but can I just ask what what interaction um, the social services team has um, with um, with the domestic violence team at, at SMT and and what relationships you you've, you've got there, please. I think it's fair to say that the interaction really is on multiple levels. Um, so there's the interaction from the multi-agency safeguarding hub down generally in Merthyr Police Station prior to COVID. So we attend daily MAREC discussions. Um, and as part of that, we would look at coordinating support for a family in that meeting where um, DART would be present at that. Um, so we would look at that really from all services avenue so that we could provide some holistic joined up support. Um, equally as part of any plans um, where domestic abuse is identified as a risk, then there would be referrals made to engage them as part of care and support planning for children um, and child protection planning. Um, frequently we're relevant, they engage in our child protection process. Um, equally, there's been some incidences of our um, children while well, we are stepping down after care provision of required referrals and we've engaged on that level as well. So I think whilst I would always accept that there's room for improvement and I think that that's a fair reflection of any services developing their work and relationship, I think there are very succinct embedded links between SMT and Mercer Children's Services. Okay, thanks for that. And, and similarly, and um, Nicola and Julie, there, there has to be a, a relationship with other areas of, of the local authority, such as housing and, and external organisations, such as uh, citizens advice, I, I, I suppose. So can you can you give us a flavour of, of, of that interaction and how you work with, with partner agencies, please? Yeah, um, housing is, is a particular um, area that we um, have to work in partnership with and we do work in partnership, obviously, from a even from the emergency accommodation perspective, where we look into place um, clients into refuge, etc. That is something that we liaise with the, the, the housing and homelessness department. Um, uh, and, you know, we work together to identify refuge places and uh, transport is put in place for those individuals. Um, plus, from a homelessness perspective and placing families um, and moving families, etc. So, so we link in with, with uh, local authority housing, plus all the RSLs in the area. So that's something that's, that we've built, you know, firm relationships with. Um, for, for instance, Merthyr Valley's Homes, we, um, we go in and we train their frontline staff in relation to DV and how to spot DV and what services a local to, to um, get people into support etc. We we have um, we have really good links with Citizens Advice Bureau. We've got a specific DV project that we're working alongside uh, the team and we've got um, an online referral process for people who need additional sort of financial support etc. Debt support in relation to DV um, relationships. We work alongside Bowzo in relation to um, anything to do with women's floating support and uh, help with uh, maintaining tenancy in relation to DV um, cases. Um, plus the fact that we um, we also make sure that we are responding adequately to the BAME population um, and we work alongside Bowzo in relation to that. Um, mental health. Um, we've got the toxic trio, which is domestic abuse, mental health and substance misuse. So we work very, very closely with mental health, the crisis team, um, referring people into GP, um, social prescribing, anything to do with that that would assist people's mental health. Um, and uh, we work alongside then Barod in relation to um, substance misuse. Um, goodness, who else? <laughs> There's quite a lot of different organisations we work alongside, um, but they are the the, the main organisations and services that we work with. That that's that's good to hear. Thanks, Julie. Um, 
how how prevalent is is domestic violence within the um, LGBT community? Is that something that's significant? We know that is significant, yeah. Um, but I think it's safe to say that we need to do more um, in relation to reaching that particular community. We don't we we don't have many um, groups or organisations locally that support the LGBT community where we can readily link in and to offer our services. So I think that is a particular difficulty. So we are coming from a little bit of a, a sort of um, standing start in relation to LGBT. But we know that, again, when we look at our MAREC data, et cetera, how many um, sort of LGBT um, cases we should be dealing with, et cetera, and we, we're not great at this moment in time. So that is something that we know and we are aware of as an area that we need to be doing more. Okay, uh, thanks, um, Julie. And I think everybody knows that uh, what what we know is 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 simply but the, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to domestic violence. Are there any, is there any research out there, um, you know, to indicate exactly how much is is going on and how much is unknown and you know, because I, I can imagine it's it's uh, it's 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 off the scale. But you know, I appreciate your your, your comments there. Yeah. I mean, it, it it will be different for different areas. Obviously, um, as we know, we said about most there being different prevalence to RCT, etc. But um, the sort of the baseline is that um, one in four women and one in six men will have, will be affected and, and will experience domestic abuse in their lifetime. So even how many people we've got on screen here or if you, you go into an office um, situation, etc., at least one in four women in that situation will be uh, affected by domestic abuse personally in, the, in their lifetime. So I think that puts a real sort of, uh, emphasis on the, the prevalence of domestic abuse. Okay, thank you. And can I can I just ask a question about the assistance you provide for for men as well? Um, I think the Act that was introduced in two thousand and fifteen does recognise that uh, domestic and sexual violence are is experienced with men. And I do understand that you you, you provide um, a service specifically for men. And I'd be interested to to you your, your comments on that, please. Yeah, I mean. Um, our domestic abuse resource team, um, so they are a team that responds to female and male victims of domestic abuse. Obviously, males will need a different response, and we are aware that that, um, that is a requirement. However, due to um, funding constraints, we aren't able to set up um, a, a male-only service. And I think from a, a sustainability perspective, it's, it's, it's always something you can try and set up, um, but it's sustaining that, that actual service for men. So what we've done is, is that it's integral to our domestic abuse team. However, we've created specialisms within the team that will, so we've got specific workers who are trained um, to respond to male victims or BAME victims, victims um, from the LGBT community, um, specifically um, disability, older people. So it is the same team members, but they've each got um, uh, a specific sort of area that they specialise and they keep up to date and trained on. Um, and that's how we're able to do that and and provide sustainable services with finite budget. OK, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and engagement from men? It, it... Um, it's it's obviously the, the, the numbers with regards to the prevalence of domestic abuse. Um, we would expect a much lower um, sort of figure to come to an, an engagement coming through the door. Um, we do have male victims, um, but if I said that we had maybe a hundred women who would engage within a quarter, we probably would have 10 men. So if, and, and that would be sort of, you know, the top ends. We may have three or four, but maybe around 10% uh, uptake. Um, we, we have, done quite a lot of sort of um, promotion work in the past, etc., to try and sort of um, advertise our services more to men. We've engaged with rugby clubs and the football clubs, etc. Um, but I think it is an inherent barrier to men 
to come along and actually disclose that they've been abused, and especially if it is a female um, perpetrator partner, because of all the things around the sort of, you know, the way um, men perceive themselves, etc. I'm unsure um, if they, if males in the past, from what we've we've actually been told, that they've had um, an adequate response from the police um, in in something along the lines of, well, she, she's smaller than you, can you sort her out type of thing? Do you know what I mean? And I think we've still got that sort of outdated viewpoint in some respects. So I think there's more barriers to men actually coming forward for support because of those historic sort of viewpoints. Okay, um, thanks. We we do have uh, an annual meeting with with um, with the police as, as part of this committee, um, and I think domestic violence um, has been discussed during those meetings, and it's certainly something that we'll we'll take forward um, in 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 the next meeting that that we have because um, it is quite concerning. Uh, I think that's that's an understatement to be to be fair. Um, and, and given the times that we live in, it, it's un, unlikely to, to get any better, sadly. So it's something we'll, we'll take forward and, and perhaps can re report back to you. But I, I'm assuming that you, you have regular briefings with the police anyway, is that, is that right? Well, uh, as Tara mentioned, we're part of the, the daily discussions and that is in relation to high risk. We have all the information from the police, etc. We have MARAC meetings, we have MASH meetings, etc. So we are linked in quite closely with the police, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Okay, I, and finally from me, I just want to turn to funding because um, I, I understand you, you you access various points of, of funding to to stay alive, really, to 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 um, to stay afloat and. Can you give us an overview of, of where you access the, the, the funding from? Um, um, and I'm not sure at this stage, reading the report, if you do get any funding from the local authority, I just, like, um, if you can pick up on that, that'd be great, thanks. I'll pick up on this one, Chair. Julie will know that I've stayed quiet from now because I've got the rain falling down on my roof, so I'm trying not to let everybody hear the sounds. Um, Good grief. Uh, in terms of funding, <laughs> in, in terms of um, funding, um, yeah, we get um, and we've had historically um, for, for many years um, a service contract with the local authority, um, which was around originally um, crime and disorder. So uh, we were the, the devolved arm of the local authority to provide community service uh, community safety functions uh, that evolved into uh, strategic coordination for domestic abuse services within Merthyr um, and that's how it stayed for for the last number of years so we get 37,000 pounds which is a core grant from the local authority um, which pretty much enables Safer Mercer to keep the lights on because that's the only element of, of clean core funding we get as a service. Uh, but then in relation to domestic abuse per se, then they come in from a plethora of other sources then. So we commission via the, the Vowder SV grant, which is the regional grant that Welsh Government uh, put into the regional areas. Um, the region being Comtaf Moganog, Mercer Tidville are the banker for that fund. Uh, and pretty much most of the funding is administered through Safer Mercer. So we get um, a share of that in order to support our for services and our uh, domestic abuse resource team. That then is supported by funding from the Police and Crime Commissioner for the Court IDFA, our recovery worker, uh, our children's programme and family uh, programme. We get additional funding from the PCC for our drive programme in response to perpetrators of domestic abuse. And then we access funds then from trust funds such as Lloyd's Foundation, Henry Smith, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, in essence, it's, it's quite a varied um, funding stream that, and I think that's been one of the, the biggest issues with domestic abuse is never had one single dedicated source of funding. It's always been down to, um, so in terms of commissioning and strategic coordination, 
it's always been messy because of the, the numbers of funders involved in the process and the number of service providers who access those funding, that funding at source. Um, so you, you can see it's, it's, it's quite a myriad of, of, of funding that comes into the local, into the, to the, the local services. Mm, yeah, okay. Um, and has that funding decreased in, in recent years? Is it, you know, is there, is there any trend developing? No. I th interestingly, we, we had a conversation, Julie and I, earlier on when we were looking at, at budgets for next year. Um, I would like to say that, that, that some of the, the information in the update report in terms of the word reason to next year in terms of sustainability have, have kind of been abated because quite a lot of the funders have come through and confirmed the funding for next year, which is positive. Um, yeah, but there, there's, there's not been increase in funds for the past 10 years or where there has been, it's certainly not a significant increase that permits you to do anything other than what you're already doing. Okay, that's interesting. Thank, thanks, Nicola. Okay, I, um, again to the committee. Any any comments or, or questions that, that you have for for anybody, please? Chair, I can see Alan Owen wants to come wants to come in. Probably on probably on the funding part. I would have thought. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> hey, Al, do you want to come in? <coughs> Apologies for uh, joining late, chair. I asked Maria to give my uh, uh, to give my uh, my late apologies uh, a bit earlier because uh, I had a meeting that overlapped. Yeah, it's um, historically the funding for um, for domestic abuse, especially through Safe and Murtha, um, came from quite a sort of strange angle. Most of the funding that um, that sustained the early development of, uh, of Safe and Murtha was home office based and then was picked up by the housing revenue account. So it's quite the sort of historic legacy. I can confirm that um, unfortunately the co-funder isn't, um, isn't increasing this year for this particular uh, support but uh, is being maintained at its existing level because the pressure over the last eight years to catch, cut budgets as you know has been quite severe. Um, I can see Taryn, uh, Taryn Stevens is uh, is online, and I think the exercise that we now need to go through is to look at the integration of this exceptionally important uh, service provision across the council responsibilities, rather than just coming through one single source. And myself and Taryn, uh, together with Chris Long uh, with housing and Paul and Ryan from Community Safety, uh, having conversations and will be having further conversations with Nicola and Safer Murtha about um, how we can reorientate and re-coordinate this uh, support for uh, uh, for domestic abuse funding. Chair, can I come back in on the yeah, back of Alan's comment there, if I, if I can? I mean, the, the reality is in terms of uplifts in funding and goodness knows what, um, we are where we are. We set against a backdrop that we've had austerity for the last 10 years. We're just about to recover and then we, we were hit by COVID. Um, we all know the, the, the realism that, that lays ahead. So from, from our perspective, it's never criticism of the local authority in terms of, of, of where they're at in terms of uplifting uplifts in, in, in any aspect at all. Um, we are immensely grateful for the service level agreement because as I said when I say it keeps the lights on it does um, because it's that free money that allows us to, to put into core that enables us to, to draw down in addition you know in excess of a million per year that contributes to the wider aspect of the agenda. So it, it's it's insignificant in relation to our turnover but significant in, allow, in allowing us to achieve that turnover. Um, the one thing that I, I would flag for the committee and, and Alan knows I would do this is, is that in relation to other local authorities, their infra services and their domestic abuse resource teams, so the, the, the standard medium and high risk services, they're what we call our core service. They, they the, the, the predominant statutory functions that the local authorities have to discharge through voted SV. And 
in Merthyr that is predominantly reliant on external grant funding, which the local authority commissions to us. So, you know, there is no issue there. But in terms of sustainability, because those funds are embedded into core within the other local authority areas, it means that Merthyr gets a disproportionate amount of the Welsh Government funding. And the risk being that particularly if we were to move towards the more commissioned uh, commissioning strategy across the regions, if if Rhonda Cannon Taff and Bridge End were to look for parity in that funding, then it would destabilise the service provisions in Mercer. So, you know, it, it, it's 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 a risk that needs to be flagged, really, rather than, than than a criticism that something needs to be done. If that if that's uh, makes sense. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate that, Chair, and it goes back to my earlier comments about the historic nature of the support for this provision, how it uh, evolved organically, and as Nicola rightly said, is disproportionately at the moment um, reliant on external funding, which is a regional function. OK, thanks. Thanks for that both. Um, I appreciate your, your honesty in, in both your comments. Um, but uh, Alan, it's good to hear that um, you, the local authority do seem to recognise that a holistic approach is, rec is, um, is needed and, and, and not sort of individual um, services. So it'll be good to, to, to see and hear how, how that develops moving forward. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's dependent as well on the on the um, operational and, st and, and strategic development of the work uh, between housing, um, community safety, and social services because it's uh, it's moved on in in a quantum leap over the last eighteen months. And I think Tarin can uh, can vouch for that. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Any any further comments or, or questions for for Nicola, Julie, or, or indeed Taryn or, or Alan? Actually, no. Okay, no problem. I've come Kevin, I've come. I've come. I've come under check. Sorry, Sorry. I, I seem to be missing. I seem to be missing the hands for some reason. <laughs> but uh, Kevin, I'm you not... can come in, and then I'll invite uh, Gary to pop in. Uh, come in then. Lovely. And Taryn Thank actually. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. It was just a, a quick follow-up question to, uh, to, to Julie, I think, um, specifically. I know, I know you were talking earlier regarding um, about the men, the men campaign and the, the, low, the low uptake in figures um, com, coming, from, coming from males. And you give a, I know it was a very broad, broad sweeping example of um, it's like an officer will grin and say, "Well, she's she's smaller than you. Can't you sort can't you sort it out?" Sort of thing. Do I know you have regular meetings with with the police to discuss cases, but do you have the opportunity to feed back these instances to the police? Because my, um, to me, it's all, it's great fla flagging these instances, but if the police don't know, they those officers need further training. There's there's not going to be any change to it. Absolutely. Um, yes, we do. Uh, and we are able to escalate any of our concerns um, to the inspector, etc. So and we've got a really good relationship with um, with the police. So we're able to do that quite quite readily, to, to be honest. So we will pick up on the feedback from from our clients and we will pick it up with police on a case by case basis, because as you rightly said, unless we flag this with the right authority, nothing changes so you know and i would say it's it isn't it isn't across the board it's not something that that i think is a huge issue i think it is one of the barriers to males um access and support and it may have become sort of more and more outdated as as sort of new officers come on board but we still have that that type of um feedback from clients and it is a massive um you know it can be the um the barrier to people coming forward for support so so we do escalate those um quite readily and especially in relation to, well to all all cases um but especially with males because 
we understand there's so many more barriers to to access and support. So yes, we do. Oh, brilliant! Th- thank you, thank you for that answer, Julian. And I and I and I totally understand why the uptake from males is different because I think, as you alluded to earlier, there's always that stigma. That stigma about well, a man should be able to sort it out. Is the <laughs> do you know what I mean? Rightly or wrongly, but yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. And we worked, we worked for so hard to try and sort of raise awareness of the fact that domestic abuse is not just violence it is centered around control of the individual so you may have an abusive relationship that has no violence in it whatsoever and it's just completely control so it is a very much an outdated sort of viewpoint in relation to well it's just the 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 physical element of it it isn't it is rooted in control lovely thank you chair thank you julie thanks kevin taryn do you want to come in at this point and then we'll move to Gerlind. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. I just wanted to, first of all, pick up in terms of the comments that have been raised about males being a victim of domestic violence. And I think I would echo really that I think is on all agencies' agenda to ensure that support is more robust. But I think it's probably important to say that we are on a journey in terms of historically how people looked at domestic violence, that it was only physical in nature and now terms like coercive control are really commonly used and understood by professionals I mean I hope that in not so too distant of the future that actually we're at that point in terms of acknowledging the impact of domestic violence on men and I feel that is really positive actually some of the comments from SMT in terms of how committed they are in terms of taking that forward um, and I must apologise again because my hand was a little bit slower at coming up after Alan's comment that I just wanted to reiterate really that you do have a local authority where directorates are really committed to being part of a puzzle about how we support our SLAs and in turn our local community. And I think that this is going to be a very good example of that in the future. Thanks, Taryn. Um, and over to Geraint, do you want to come in? Thanks, Gareth. i uh, just like to thank um, Julie and Nicola for coming today and bringing this report. You know, some of the figures are, are striking and alarming, and they when you see some of those numbers. I think where we're fortunate that you know that it could be a good thing though that Merthyr is one valley, one big town, and you were accessible to most people. You know, so I think that's I think that's a plus for Merthyr. You know, if you if we were a bigger county with further and, and the office was further afield, I think a lot of this would go under the radar and not reported. So I think that is a, that is a positive thing. Um, I think for us as a council, I think we. We know domestic violence is a huge problem. It's um, it's and it's a tip of a a bigger iceberg. Underneath that, you know, there's all societal issues under there, and for the council, it causes housing problems, social services problems, you know, and the cost escalate. So I think we know, you know, if we could nip it in the bud early at that domestic violence issue right at the top, um, we can solve a lot of problems and save a lot of money as well you know um you know going forward um i have got one question which which is it's been you know with me a little while is domestic violence more of a generational thing are, are the older people more more of a bit of a perpetrator than the younger generation or are you finding it's coming all the way through to the younger people as well we we actually did some research probably it was probably about 10 years ago now it was called kafka and what it looked like is putting together, um, and it was multi-agency, there was lots and lots of different agencies and local authority departments involved. And we looked at trying to narrow down from data what a typical, and I don't like to use the word typical, because um, there is no typical victim, but like that age group, how the makeup of that individual. And uh, even today now, when we're looking at that, the, the age group where it's more prevalent is between around like the 25 to 35 mark. That's where the, the sort of prevalence is. Whether that's where the people are more likely to come forward at that age, we know that the, we do get um, a number of cases that come through involving elderly people. But it's that the generational thing for elderly people is a bit like, well, you made your bed, you lie in it. You don't sort of, you know, you don't talk about it you put up with it type of thing and then you've got the added issues then when maybe um a partner whether that's the abuser or the victim becomes infirm and well 
or there's elements of dementia, that type of thing, and there's less likely then for, for that couple to, to sort of split. Um, and and that sort of, you know, the, the abuse is perpetuated type of thing. We're not all about making people or sort of speaking to people and suggesting people split. We are not. We've, we've got, um, you know, we recognise the fact that, you know, even where there is domestic abuse, that people want to stay together and it's about how they can stay together safely um, and, you know, make sure that the children are safe, etc. so they can, they can live as a safe unit. So it isn't all about, you know, or you've got to leave that individual to be safe. It's how we can support that unit. It doesn't always work. Sometimes the risk is too high and, and we do recommend that that relationship should not go forward. But we do recognise that there will be a number of families where domestic abuse is present, but that we can help them sort of, you know, on a different different path, we can put some support in there and um, some monitoring with regards to the perpetrator. We can put support in there for the children and the victim so that potentially they can live together more safely as a unit. But I agree, if we can get a, we can get in and put some more support in further upstream, then there's less trauma um, experienced by all family members. And then, of course, it isn't as costly at the other end then. Okay. Finally, for me, before I leave you, right, as cabinet member responsible for this area, I know Alan's the same as the head of service and the deputy chief executive. Any recommendations you may have uh, going forward, please come to us. We can bring it through the scrutiny committee here, right? And then, and then we'll, we'll run with it. So, yeah, thank you very much for today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Geraint. And I just just want to reiterate those words, really, uh, Julia Nicola. You know, if there's if there's anything you you want to come to us on, you know, any aspect of of what is such a multifaceted area, um, please do so. Um, you know, certainly the local authority does recognise the importance of of domestic violence and and you know the, the the service that you do provide and and moving forward as we come out the other end of COVID, undoubtedly um, the, the DART service will will be more important than ever. So it, it so we, I think we'll we'll close at that point. But thank you very much both for for attending this afternoon. Uh, Malcolm, do you want to come in? Yeah, just quickly ask something. Apologies. Like that, just following on from, from Gavin's point, really, about um, is it a generational thing? But does it also something that tends to run in families? If a child has grown up seeing domestic violence in their household, are they more likely to commit domestic violence themselves? Or is it not related to that at all? Very much so. If if you've lived in a, in a, it's about societal norms, isn't it? If you live in a in a, an abusive relationship, you under, you're understanding of what a, a relationship, if that is um you know a, an unhealthy relationship, you don't realise that it's it's a norm. It's if there's um abuse from you know in in your parents' relationship, then that's the pattern that's tracked with regards to potentially your relationship, unless at some particular time you do have support and there is an awareness of the fact that is, you know, a healthy relationship looks differently. But I think that's really important in relation to, you know, where where the intervention is, what age group of that child. So the earlier we get in, the earlier support we can put in um, and, and to sort of awareness raise with young people what a, a healthy relationship looks like, then we can break that cycle. And I think that's important to say that it can be generational, where there's no intervention or, or little intervention, but where we can put support and intervention in, and especially further upstream, then there is a different way that those families, those young people then can go uh, forward and live their lives in within a healthy relationship. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. Yeah. Anybody else before before we finish? Any any further comments or, or queries or questions? Please. No. I think Alan's hand is historic. Yeah. Just just for, from myself and as chair, both Julian Nicola. Thanks for attending again today. Um, it's been incredibly informative, and I think it's um, it's opened up a, a number of uh, topics that we can take forward in future. So so thank you very much both um, so, for your time this afternoon. You're welcome. Can I just add, though, from a local authority perspective, in terms of partnership working, I think we're extremely lucky in Merthyr because we're a small unitary authority. As as Taryn said, in terms of the, the, the puzzle aspect internally within the local authority, I think that extends to partners externally as well. Um, so from that perspective, I think our service services in Merthyr have the best 
uh, kind of services that are, that are available, whereas in larger authorities, we're more than acutely aware that this doesn't happen. Mm. Okay. Can, I, can I say one last thing, please, in relation to that? Uh, in relation to COVID and the way we've been able to communicate with the local authority has improved, I think, during COVID. I think things have become more streamlined. There's been less barriers to attend in different meetings, etc. So I'm hoping that as we go through COVID and out the other end, that we will be able to capture the, the best bits of it, really. Well, that's that's good to hear. OK, Th thanks very much. Thanks both for attending this afternoon. You're more than welcome to uh, to stay, um, but we certainly wouldn't hold it against you if you left now. All right, but thanks very much and uh, take care and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. OK, um, moving on. I think the, the next uh, item is an information report. Um, so am I right in saying, Marie, that we, we're unable to discuss that at the moment? You are, Chair, yes. So there's no officers okay. um, present. Um, but just to confirm that we've undertaken to attend the next meeting. Um, to be able to give you a, a full update at that point. Okay, no problem. Thanks for that. Um, so that was the, the update on the response to the coronavirus. Um, and then the next agenda, agenda item is to discuss the work programme for the for the forthcoming year. So um, if we turn to pages 19 and 20, sorry, 19 to 30, um, we can have a look at that then as a committee. Gary, do you want to run come in? Yeah, Chair, obviously I haven't got to stay for this part now, so can I go to another meeting? Yeah, by all means, you're more yeah, than welcome. No. Thanks for your attendance, uh, Gary, always appreciate it. No, you no, no, thank you. I, was, I thought that was a real good report, that, so I was, it was good, good to be able to listen to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, very, very topical and very pertinent at the moment. Thanks, Gary. I'm just going to put the light on before I descend into darkness. Okay. I'll, um, I'll come to you on a... Come in. Got your hand up, Markham. It's probably no, no, hands not historic. Up, no. well, I believe it's um, myself, Chair. I've got my hand up. Just to say, if um, possible, I'm just going to dip out at this juncture, if that's OK. Yeah, by all means, of course. No problem. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for attending, by the way, uh, uh, Taryn. All the best. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Lee. Same with, yeah, yeah. Same with each. I, I have to go and, uh, and attend the same meeting as Gary Thomas has just gone out to attend. No problem. Very important, no doubt, Al. So take care and see you soon. Okay, thanks. Ta -ra. Lee, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, it was just about um, the work programme, really. Um, page 30. Okay. Um, I, I think I brought it up before. It's the uh, sexual violence. So we, we haven't had a, you know, since I've been in scrutiny, we haven't had a report from them. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've just discussed how domestic violence affects our communities so I think you you know it's something I'm passionate about of getting new pathways in and discussing uh, their work yeah I got I, no, no problem with the with doing I don't that know where, where we can get it in is it something that we can arrange Maria is there, is there can, an opportunity in the work program I can certainly look into it chair um my assumption which I need to check with you is if we're talking primarily about sexual violence, my natural conduit to go and find out if we could get someone along would be new pathway. Yeah. Just yeah. To check that, that the committee is comfortable with me making approach to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, looking at the work program, um, it really depends on whether the committee wants two reports in one go, and if that's the case. We've got two meetings left in this municipal year. The next meeting is scheduled for uh, the 23rd of February. And the subsequent meeting, the last of this municipal year, is the 13th of April. So uh, which would your preference be? Well, I think bear in mind from what Lee has said, I, I think you'd, you'd, you'd prefer it sooner rather than later, Lee. I, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That. It, uh, let me have a look at the work programme, sir. Uh, yeah. 
do we have room to fit it in? I think I think it's best. I think if speak to new, if you speak to new pathways, Maria, and, and ask them when they see it feasible that they could put a report together. Okay, no problem. I'll, um, I'll start the wheels in motion in with, with regards to that, and I'll come back to the committee with a feedback then. Okay, great. I, I, I don't know, like they work across a number of areas right across Wales, so maybe just tell them we're interested in in Merthyr and, and maybe data that, that against our CT, I suppose. That's fine, okay. Right. I, 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 Chair, I, I did work for him for seven months, uh, setting up a family support, and I, I was quite right. surprised that, like, when I did work for him, um, the cases I had were mainly RCT, which was right. a bit of a, I, I thought it would be split to tell her the truth, when, when mm -hmm. mainly the families were RCT, but you know, the, what what they found was when 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 a case comes forward, the, the ISVA would work with that person, but then the old family would fall apart around there. There was no support for that that family going forward. So that's why they started the family support network. But then I'd say 99% of the families that were work, working with were in RCT. Right, so, okay. That's, that's interesting, especially what we've just heard with regards to instances of domestic violence. In yeah. Merthyr compared to RCT, you'd think that trend would follow. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. And um, like, what's what's really shocked me, and I didn't realise that, that the building in you know when 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 you see you you think of people getting raped or whatever, you think stranger danger or whatever, but the majority are people they know and their family members or whatever, and you wouldn't believe. Like, if I thought before I went to work there, I I think well. Oh, if somebody gets raped, they get taken to hospital and then they have the forensic examination done there. But they don't, they go to new pathways and all the examinations are done there. And I, the examination room would be next to where my office was. And you wouldn't believe how many people come in during the day. It, it shocked, it really, really shocked me. Okay, thanks for that, Lee. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, actually. So um, it's clearly something that's under the radar. Yeah. And and it's clearly something that, that may um, not be reported as, as much as other local authorities leave. Yeah. From what you're suggesting, it, it, it seems that way. So yeah. it's, um, you know, I think it's important we bring back that, bring that back to scrutiny. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and like I, I know Julie said they had um, uh, five uh, independent violence, uh, domestic violence advocates then. In, in Dart and whatever. But when I left there, there was only two in New Pathways. And, you know, that that they are covering a, a massive area, not just Merthyr as well, is they severely underfunded. So, you know, mm -hmm. something that we can discuss as well. Okay, good. That's, that sounds like a good topic. Thanks thanks for that. Um, are, there, are there any other elements of the, the work programme that, Maria, you, you first, is there anything that, that needs to be brought to our attention? Any, any changes? Um, no changes as, as such, Chair. Um, two things, really, just to confirm that the next uh, meeting, the report that's scheduled to be brought before the committee is around subsidised bus services and the City Deal Metro programme. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the next one on. Obviously, the uh, coronavirus update report is going to be spoken to at the next meeting. So. You've got those two um, reports which we brought before you. Um, but other than that, um, taking what Councillor Davis has said, if I liaise with uh, New Pathways um, and see when they are able to uh, come forward to meet with the committee to discuss the issue in, uh, in question, uh, then we can slot that into the work programme as soon as that's been confirmed by yourself as chair and the rest of the committee. Yeah, lovely. Are the, the committee okay with that? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I, I just want to focus on now the, the information report that, that, that came before the committee today, um, which unfortunately we couldn't we couldn't discuss, but nevertheless it's it it, it is incredibly important um, given given the situation we currently find ourselves in. And 
if, if we can, I just want to go through the, the template. I'm not sure if everyone's got it on page 17 of the, of the committee report. And I'd, I'd just like to open it up to the committee, really, and ask you what, what, what you feel about that information and, um, you know, what could be added. Um, and, and we'll go from there. So does anyone want to want to come in at this point and um, perhaps uh, tell me your thoughts on page 17? the report uh fixed penalty no this is a really low a uh 30 yeah. you know zeros up until september and then 37 okay yeah uh, i think is ryan with us ryan evans yeah i'm your chat i uh i ryan um this wouldn't Specifically, be your area though, Ryan. Am I right in saying? Um, what, what are you looking at? Sorry, fixed pen. Sorry, sorry. page 17, and it's the, the table. Then is the third item on the table? Uh, no, that's not mine, right? Yeah, okay, that, that would be more trading standards, environmental health, I suppose. Yeah, okay. From, from a reporting perspective, I think we can have more information on that because. Um, it says number of fixed penalty notices issued by the council, but we don't know if they to do with business. You know, if the the business is closed. You know, has it been a, a you know how long has the the notice been for? So I think if we can have more specific information regarding that, Maria, that yeah, would be helpful. No, it could be like thirty seven. It could be ten in the same incident. So yeah. You know, so we had that we, big issue with the cars over in Reader Car. How many? That would have been police, I suppose, would they? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm afraid. No, not sure. But I can certainly go back to the officers um, if it would be helpful to have um, categories. So, are, are the fixed penalty notice commercial mm. or domestic? Um, yeah. You can put a differentiation in there. Uh, and additionally, if we could break it down a little further to identify whether fixed penalty notices are repeat for specific people mm -hmm. or are they 37 different instances, that may be something which would allow you to develop a bit of a, a clearer picture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and similarly, the one above that, that you know, the joint visit, um, visits made by environmental health, trade and standards licensed officers, are they return visits? Are they one offs? Okay. You, you know, I think we need to 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 create a a bigger picture on what what the data means. That's fine. That's not a problem. Um, and then moving down, homelessness presentation continues to increase. Okay, but how how much does it continue to increase? By is it you know exponential? You know how how. How much is it increasing by? Because that wording doesn't really mean a lot, unfortunately. Okay. Great, I'll get them to uh, and, that then and clarify. And I think we could perhaps get more data on the number of um, businesses that have been supported. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, 22 and a half million has been administered uh, to businesses. Um, but it, it would be good to, to hear what businesses are continuing to receive state assistance. Um, and maybe there's a drop, been a drop off because of eligibility changes. Um, so it'd be good to have a bigger picture regarding that. And I know in the pre-meeting, Maria, we mentioned something regarding um, universal credit. Yeah. Um, particularly regarding the um, possible loss of a twenty pound a week, um, which may be introduced in in April, but it, you know it may change depending on the the political will of of, of different people. Um, if we could get an update on the numbers. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're in receipt of universal credit in with Tidville. Um, yep. 
and and go from there. Really. Sorry, various people want to come in. Kevin, do you want to come in first? Right, <laughs> that way don't. Uh, <laughs> the um, main, main thing I wanted to, wanted to touch on, God, be on uh, Chair, to be honest, it was uh, we haven't had a meeting since beginning of December. Is that right? That's about right, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's the first one this year, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and I know we asked for an update on the, the coronavirus response, and they've given us this high-level le high table. But what what has happened? What has happened? What happened in December? That's not on you that we weren't that, that we haven't been updated about. Was the mass testing? There's no mention of the mass mm -hmm. testing in this re this information report whatsoever. And we were the pilot for the country, so uh, I would I would have expected something something to be in to be in, been in there whether it whether it was a good result or or a bad result. So we mm -hmm. we could have a look and scrutinise it. Mm -hmm. Um, just to, to qualify, the deadline for this report to be uh, uploaded was prior to the Christmas break, at which point the mass testing was still continuing. Because right. if you recall, they extended the exercise for an additional week. Yeah. So it could be that they didn't have those cumulative figures at that point. Um, but it's certainly something which they should have recourse to be able to produce now for the committee. Yeah, but I, I, w I would have thought there might have been a, a, a mention in there of, of, of the mass testing with a lot yeah. more robust information to come on the on, on the further report. Okay. Chair, so that's all I wanted at this point. OK, thanks, Kev. Uh, Lee, are you, right, do, well, do you want to come I in? Think, yeah, I, well, I don't know if Malcolm, Malcolm has hands been up. Is our yeah, Mark? apologies, Malcolm. Do you, do you want to pop, come in at this time? Oh, that's all right. Thanks, Lee. Uh, yeah, just going back to the table on page 17, um, there's also a couple of large sums of money that we've been awarded, which we haven't spent a great deal of yet. I'll be interested to know more detail on what we have spent it on and what, more importantly, what we're planning to spend these other sums of money on. OK. Thanks, Malcolm. I think we discussed um, the one, didn't we? The, the, the 844 was discussed in the last meeting. Was near the passive houses that Regen brought forward. There was a, uh, yeah. yeah. It's in the to go in, so I know a bit more about it. Is, yeah, is it is it on the, the following page, eighteen? No, it's it's the bottom of that one. It's the eight hundred and sixty-seven. Well, right, yeah. Okay. No, I'm looking at the uh, transforming towns. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. yeah, there are. Sorry, sorry, sorry yeah, I was on a wrong page. There's a, there's a, on, on the following page, then, page 18, there's a bullet point as well. It says significant cutback of vegetation on ground centre path. Where exactly is that? Does anyone know? No. Um, no. Yeah, it's good to know where that is. OK. Um, I know, um, Chair, there was a lot of cutback along the Trevethic Trail. Um, as someone who's walk, walking quite regularly, there was a substantial amount of work cutting back of vegetation along there. So I'm not sure right. how much of that is applicable. Um, right. okay. You can also see that obviously there is mention uh, in the bullet point below introduction of a permanent bollard um, structure on the lower high street. So I think that might be um, part of the funding that comes from the, um, the query that Malcolm made in regards to transforming towns. I don't mm. know if that would have cost 50 grand, but, but I'm not sure. Okay. okay, but it, it, I think there's a running theme around here, Maria, to be honest, and it's, it's, it's lack of detail, really. Um, That's right. You know, they're given the bones of, of information, but I mean, not, not on, you know, to say significant cutback of vegetation or town set path, well, where's that? Mm. Um, okay. I know so there's been a new path. The... I mean, that new path running from from the other side of the road of the Civic over to the old Tesco supermarket. Um, I'm not sure if that's anything to do with with COVID funding from Welsh government, but um, I don't think there's there's been a need to cut back vegetation there, so I don't think that's the area. Mm. 
No. Um, if I request that the officers dig down another level to give you that detail which you yeah. you need, um, mm. we can try on that the next one to check whether that will be sufficient to meet the committee. Yeah. Um, and we can continue, it's a live document, so we can continue to uh, mm -hmm. amend as required to meet your needs. Yeah, because what I what I'd be keen to, to do um, is is generate a, a dashboard, really, a, you know, like a COVID dashboard of of various themes with, with different data on, and see that the progress that that's making through a through a time frame. Okay. You know, I, I don't know how how easy that is, and, and maybe you know we need to go away and and and, and think about it, but. I, I I just like a document where we can compare and contrast yeah. um, how how the directorate has performed, I suppose, in you know over the COVID pandemic, you know, right from the beginning. Um, okay, I'm I'm happy to take uh, an action back to discuss uh, with the coordinator for this. At mm -hmm. the moment, that's Paul Lewis, I believe. He's he's coordinating the COVID response. Right. Okay. So, um, I'm happy to have a dialogue with him. Obviously, copy you into yeah. that. Just to read this theory. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a large document. Just, just a number, really, of performance indicators to see yep. where we've gone from from the the end of March, because it's, it's a significant journey the local authority has made um, on various aspects. Um, and I, I just want some something that can that can map that journey, Maria. Yeah, that's and I know these are just words that. at the moment, and they're just thoughts running running in my head. And sorry, it's not specific enough. Um, but if we can look at that, that that'd, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scott, do, uh, Scott O'Lee, do you want to do you want to come in? Uh, mine, mine was just about um, following up from Kevin said about the mass testing and you know the numbers. I know. It may be public health and might give that figures. You know, we don't know whether, well, I don't anyway, whether the figures they had were high or low. You know, there was a thousand per or whatever, and, you know, 200, 200 out of a thousand. I, I don't know. You know, it seems quite high to me, but then was it more than they were expecting out of those that tested positive? How many came back positive on the lab testing? It, we, we don't seem to have any detail. On, on how that went I, I, and I suppose now we're at discussing it and how many vi uh, vaccinations have been given out in the local authority mm. um, I, think, you know. I think you know it's something that the full council should, should, should be brought to full council you know and and, and discussed yeah. in my opinion um, because the the significance of it you know something that, that was only done previously in Liverpool and that was only a couple of weeks before yeah, <laughs> and it's happened, and we don't know the results. Yeah, so you know, obviously, it's not for us to to dictate what 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 comes before full council, but we can certainly bring it before um, before scrutiny, Maria, if if we can, please. Yeah, I'll certainly try my very best to pull something together, Jay. Thanks, Scott. Have you got a some input? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Just to touch on something that you mentioned in regards to the um, the uplift in the universal credit. Um, as someone whose partner actually receives the uplift in the universal credit claim that she has, um, obviously as soon as it was announced that there, there was a possibility of it being pulled and the alternatives that they were offering, me being a stat guy, I sort of threw all of the money together, tried working it all out. And yeah, it, it, on a personal level, it is going to be a substantial loss. Even if they mm. do provide us with a £500 booster, whatever they, whatever they attempt to do, it's still not going to be enough, especially... Mm. Given the circumstances, the majority of these people who have actually claimed universal credit have done so not because they've come out of work in anticipation to going back to work. They've come out of work because they've lost their jobs because of the pandemic. So they are not necessarily going to gain anything coming out to the other side of this, where obviously companies are on the bottoms anyway. They're not going to be able to employ. It's like um, I heard yesterday, and, and, and as much as it's not exactly relevant to Merth, but Halfords in Pontypridd, you know, a closing. Um, yeah. And, and and that is the nearest Halfords work in Halfords garage, in a in a local vicinity. And it's just it's terrible to see something like that 
having to shut down. But yeah, it's it's going to be massively, massively terrible sort of impact, especially to the finances of of, of my home um, on a personal level. So I think it, it definitely needs to be readdressed. Um, and, and as far as I'm concerned, it needs to be kept. But you know, I'm not a decision maker on that scale. I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, Lee is a historic and maybe not. It, is, it was, sorry, Chair. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to have that on my t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do it. Um, okay. Um, scrutiny referrals. I think we've covered um, item six then scrutiny referrals, feedback, and follow up actions. Um, I think there's enough for you to go on there, Maria. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th thanks, thanks very much. Um, and then agenda item seven is reflection and evaluation of the meeting and just any thoughts really and um, anything you'd, you'd like to add and, and, and perhaps bring back to another meeting maybe. Any, any thoughts? Malcolm? Yeah, I just thought it was very sobering, to, you mm. know, especially to find out how much of a problem it is in Merthyr compared to other to other towns and other similar authorities. Um, you know, obviously it's it's something that we need to look at in, in depth to try and get down to the mm. root causes of. Mm. Absolutely, and 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 Maria, um, what I was thinking throughout the meeting, and um, sorry, not throughout, but at some point during the meeting was how what what can we do as a follow-up to to that report because it, it it clearly it was a very important report clearly it's a significant issue throughout the county borough mm -hmm. it's something that's you know just the tip of the iceberg and i i don't know personally i, I don't know what you know anybody's thoughts you know is it something we can follow up you know, to look at. I mean, Alan, you know, mentioned a, a, a different approach. Um, you know, they're looking at a more a holistic approach. And I, I, but I don't know how we can follow that up and scrutinise that, it, it, you know, further down the line, Maria. I, mm. I'm just perhaps looking for some advice, really. Um, well, the fact that these conversations are ongoing um, and they are looking at how we take a whole authority level to the partnership working. Um, mm. To identify, you know, what we can do mm. uh, and what we're able to do, mm. looking at our current situation. Um, I think at the point, I could certainly liaise with Alan and um, sort of find out, you know, if there's a, 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 a post date for those meetings to take place. Yeah. And then, you know, suggest the committee are interested in hearing feedback on that. So rather yeah. than coming back with a fully developed model, mm. you could act as critical friends as well as scrutineers yeah, to look at the proposal. Because what I am concerned that could potentially happen after the report is domestic violence is done now as a theme, as a topic, and it's forgotten about. Mm. And I really don't want that to happen. Mm. Um, you know, we, we all know the, the significance of it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to bring it back at, at some point um you know in, in in the near future um and of course we could invite uh you know smt along and dart along you know but um i i'm just looking for more if that makes sense maria yeah yeah i'll um i'll open a dialogue with alan regarding that to have a look at, at um from his perspective a service lead for for the current sport or primary connection with mm. david Ursa. Because um, from what Alan was saying, it appeared that he was leading the coordination of this new phase of discussion. You know, if we um, make it clear to him now, well, the committee would welcome the chance to be involved in the shaping mm -hmm. of a future arrangement, then yeah, perhaps absolutely. that would be a catalyst to bring uh, a report forward sooner rather than later. Yeah, good, good. Because I, I, I really, I really don't want to forget about this. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a theme that we can continue, um, and I think that that that'll be a, a good example of how we can okay. um, continue this theme uh, moving forward. 
Okay. Thanks for that. Any other, anything from anyone else at all? Yeah. One, one okay. thing I, I, I just thought of now, and just thinking how much domestic violence in Merthyr may be partnered with alcohol. Um, mm. You know, they, they, they seem, in, in Merthyr, there seems to be a big culture on alcohol, drinking in the house, and especially through all of this pandemic, people have been drinking more in the house. So I just wondered how many of the cases would have been associated to to alcohol. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it's something we we you're just discussing and doing more um, advertising within our communities, making small videos or posters or stuff, and you know how much there, it's, it's affecting people. There was a there was a, a phrase that um, either Nicola or, or Julie used in in the report yeah. called the toxic trio, mm. and. I've never heard that before. I don't know about anyone else, but I've, I've never heard it, it described as that before. It was substance misuse, and I can't remember the other two, to be honest. Um, alcohol and domestic alcohol. Yeah, um, alcohol is it? Yeah, <laughs> but it, it it was something that that really you know pricked my ears. You know, the the, the toxic trio, and I think that that follows on from what you were saying with regards to alcohol. The, you know, when, yeah, you have, and, when you have a combination of these three, it's lethal. And, and the, the biggest domestic violence weekends are Wales, England, Man United, mm. Liverpool. Mm. I, you know, I, was, I said to my wife on Sunday, I said, thank God I was nil-nil. I said there'd be thousands of wives out there that would uh, would be better today for that. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm laughing, but it is, it is true. Yeah, no, no, it's a serious point. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I... Thanks, for that, Marie. I, I, I know I've said it before, but I, I, it, it's too important to, to leave. I think, and no, you know, and, yeah. and by leaving it, then concerned that the committee forgets about it, and uh, we, we can't really. It would be um, remiss of us to do that. Okay, I, I'm happy then to to draw the um, meeting to a close. Then, so just to thank everyone for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing you all in in six weeks' time. All right. Thanks, Dave. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Take care, everyone. All the best. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. All the best, boys.